This is episode 15 of How to Kill a Piano. I'm your host, George Tate. And as always, thanks so much for coming back and listening. If you haven't been here in a while, hey, welcome back. I appreciate you. If you have some catching up to do, there are lots of episodes to listen to. Like I said, this is episode 15. This is a story podcast, which means every episode builds on the last episode. There's a couple exceptions where we go behind the scenes of both the original stage play and and the music that we are, are doing here. But this week, we are finally back to the story where we're covering chapter 12. And before we get to that, I just want to say thank you again for being here, for listening. Thank you for your reviews that you folks have been writing and posting. If you haven't done that yet, go over to our Facebook, leave a review there with our How to Kill a Piano podcast page. Uh, Or if you're on iTunes or Google or Spotify or wherever it is that you listen to your podcast and you want to leave it there, please do so. Uh, We won't see those as quickly, but we will certainly see them and every little bit helps get the word out if you haven't rated us please rate us that helps keep us present and and the internet algorithms working in our favor so all of that is appreciated and certainly certainly loved so thank you very much for that last we left our story we found george in the music teacher's room. Some time has passed and it ended with him chewing on a biscuit. And that's where we pick up the story. So without further ado, here we go. How to Kill a Piano, Chapter 12, The Training Exercise. Knowing that something works is simple. Knowing how that same something works can be intimately complex. I'm willing to bet That in your house, you have a magic window. That window allows you to see into the past whenever you'd like. It might even allow you to see what's happening across the world right now or deeply into worlds that might not even exist. You might have multiple windows that allow you to do this. I've heard that some people even come to carry these small oracles in their pockets. Charlie and I weren't much for televisions or screens. That's simply not part of this world. I left those behind when I was rescued from the cinderblock beanstalks. The point is, I don't know how they work, but then again, I don't need to. In a world where little is black and white, the keyboards seem to be the exception. Where Charlie might have been great at collecting books, our piano was well-schooled at collecting dust from our basement. I've learned that they're incredibly difficult to kill, Pianos never seem to die. Instead, we die around them. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Where were we in the story? Let's see. Uh, do, 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 do. That's right. Sarah's music room. Charlie was frozen, etc., etc. The biscuit. Uh, da, 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 da. It's organic, yada, yada. Ah, here's where it picks up. How do you feel? Sarah said accusingly as I bit down on the biscuit. At first, it tasted like chalk as I chewed. My saliva began to swirl with the sandpaper texture. I first tasted the overwhelming flavor of peanut butter, and that was quickly followed with a hint of blueberry and garlic dancing on the tip of my tongue. It wasn't awful, but it certainly wasn't delicious. I'm okay, I confessed. I admit I'm a bit confused on what's going on. How did she do that? How do you know Uncle Charlie? What do you want with us? You can keep me, but please let Uncle Charlie go. Sarah filled two glasses. The first was a glass of water. As she placed a coaster down on top of the piano and the brimming glass on top of that, everything went silent. No longer did I hear the soundboard echo to our voices in the room. I felt like I could hear the strings tighten as if it was nervous as the piano precariously balanced the glass of water on top. The second glass also went down on a coaster. Sarah positioned it to the right of the first on top of the piano and filled it with a muddy-looking liquid. It was thick, dark green, and poured out of the pitcher in chunks. It smelled awful. The piano didn't seem to mind. Slow down. I'm not here to hurt anyone. Let's take it one question at a time. (laughs) Yeah, right. You froze my uncle. Your piano's nearly bit my hands off. Your dog is a shapeshifter. What else in this room can hurt us? Anything can hurt you if you let it. That's not why you're here. 
you wanted to learn how you could fight the Hazelton. That's why we brought you here. I'm here to teach you. Have a sip of both of those. But if I were you, I'd finish with the water. I picked up the glass of sludge and held it under my nose. That smells vile, I said, turning my head away in disgust. I'm not drinking this sludge. I'll answer anything you'd like, but only after you drank the entirety of both glasses, Sarah scolded. I wanted to run, but I couldn't leave Uncle Charlie behind, so I stalled the only way I know I could. By talking. How do I know I can trust you? You don't. Here's your first lesson. Don't accept treats from anyone but Charlie. The biscuit you just ate was poisoned. That sludge will allow you to keep breathing. You have about five minutes to make up your mind. If you don't drink it, you'll be dead, and I'll have Sharon come collect you. If you do, you'll live to tell another story. Your choice, young one. Sarah's fingers ran an arpeggio all the way up to her piano. Sticks settled in, her chin deeper into the carpet, constantly at her feet. I'm 17. I came back at her with a snotty sneer. I fail to see where I misspoke. Sarah quipped back sternly as she glanced at the clock on the wall. She followed the second hand with her eyes as she reached over, adjusting the weight on her metronome. It started to swing in rhythm with the clock. They seemed to click together for an eternity. This is a joke, right? Sarah shrugged and mumbled to herself. Oh, Sharon, I hope you're right about him. The sound of the clock was louder, and I could feel the metronome beating in my eardrums. I could feel my heart pounding in my chest. My pulse matched the beat, and I nervously ran my hand to the back of my neck. You, you wouldn't actually poison one of your students, would you? Sarah said nothing. My breathing started to quicken. I looked over at Uncle Charlie, still frozen on the couch with a smile on his face. If I didn't know he couldn't move, and if Sarah hadn't taken the book from his hands, I would have thought that he was simply lost in the pages of a conjuring book. But instead, he was under some kind of spell. I couldn't explain it, and I certainly couldn't break it. If I do this, I weighed my options carefully. Will you let him go? Will you let us both go? I held my nose, closed my eyes, and I took my first gulp. I immediately spit off the first mouthful all over the sheet music in front of me. The piano's fallboard snapped shut with a great growl. The sludge seemed to sizzle as it hit the wood grain of the piano. Easy girl, Sarah cooed, as she grabbed a towel from inside her piano bench to wipe the sludge from the piano's wood. He's not our enemy. Come on now, George. You have to actually drink it, not make a mess of yourself. I eyed Sarah skeptically, and I reluctantly took another gulp. This time, I chased it down with the water. It all tasted fruity, like kale and vanilla. Once I was ready for it, I think I actually liked the way it tasted. Or maybe I was relieved that I wasn't going to die. More? Sarah joked. Actually, yes. What, what's in it? What was in that biscuit? Sarah poured a half a glass more and I drank it willingly. I enjoyed it. The biscuit? That was harmless. The sludge was nothing more than kale, spinach, some flax seeds, a sai powder, cherry juice, and some of the finest pomegranate you'll ever taste. Relax, it's a smoothie. We drink it almost every day. It's harmless. So there wasn't any poison? You tricked me? I thought you enjoyed tricks. You certainly enjoy your Uncle Charlie's. Those are different. Consent is everything. Charlie doesn't pretend his tricks are real, and he doesn't go around pretending that someone could get hurt, let alone die. I said, exasperated. One thing Charlie hasn't taught you is that you can learn to like anything, even those things that make you uncomfortable. You quickly learn to like that cup of sludge, as you call it. That's progress. There's hope for you. I didn't say I liked it. May I have some more water, please? Sarah picked up the pitcher of water and held it. In, in a moment. Now, to answer your questions, one at a time, I wanted to see how you'd perform under stress of possible death, and if the piano would bite your hands off. What? My eyes widened, and I quickly jumped away from the pianos and joined Charlie on the couch. 
I'm pleased to say you have both your hands and your heart didn't pound out of your chest. You're a survivor, George. Sharon might be right about you after all. Right about me? I asked, confused. Me, Sharon, Charlie, we're not of this world. This has become our home, and the only thing that keeps our home safe is if Charlie doesn't remember what we are. That was his choice that he made long ago. He erased us, but small bits of those memories are still all over your house. What about sticks? Sticks? Sticks is just a dog. You're talking a lot, but you're not saying much. Are you always this frustrating? Maybe it's you who aren't listening. I'm answering everything you asked me to. Okay, lesson's over. We're done for the day. Charlie and I are leaving. Time to go. So if you could just unfreeze him, that'd be great. Sarah let out a long sigh. (sighs) Very well. Let me show you one last thing. Then you're both free to go. Follow me. Sarah calmly stood and walked out of the room. The strings inside her piano began to vibrate. I walked over to Charlie, kissed him on the forehead, and said quietly in a whisper, I'll come back for you. I promise. Don't be silly, Sarah's voice said from the other room. I promise he's fine. This isn't the first time and won't be his last. I followed Sarah out of the music room and into the room with the baby grand and the fireplace. She felt around beneath the mantle until her fingers found the right loose stone. She pressed it inward, and the firebox, still lit, began to recede away from us and slid out of sight to the left like an automatic door at the grocery store. This has been one crazy afternoon. I mumbled to myself as I ducked under the mantle and followed Sarah down a tight corridor. There was a light at the end that seemed to glow. When I reached the opening, I found myself in a room with ten-foot ceilings. Every wall was lined with floor-to-ceiling books. There was piping that traveled around the top of each bookcase that connected the room together. It was complete with a ladder that ran on wheels along that piping. It was larger than Charlie's, but they were organized the same way, by color, shape, and size. Sarah's voice broke the silence as I took in the room. We all have them. I turned towards Sarah. Books? I questioned. Athenaeums. We? Charlie, Sharon, me, the others. How many are there? At one time, there were millions of us. I'm not sure how many of us are left. We don't congregate like we used to. There's certainly less than there used to be. Sarah's expression dropped as she took a pause and looked down at the floor. My attention fell to the desk at the center of the room. There was a typewriter and two stacks of paper. One stack was blank and the other was filled with typewritten text. Next to that was some binding material that looked like someone was sewing the pages of the covers together by hand. Sarah's gaze broke and noticed me eyeing the desk. It's a bit of an art form. Not all of us are great at it, but I think I do a pretty good job, especially after all this time. Charlie was always the best craftsman out of all of us. Sharon, a close second, but then again, she has a bit of a reputation for bringing things to an end. What is it for? This? This is our communication network. In part with each other, and also the rest of the world, we observe and record, we do our best to guide, then we push those records forward through time. Once something is written here, we bind it, it finds a home and a place on our shelves, and a duplicate appears in every Athenian's library. How often is something added? That varies. At least once a year. Sometimes monthly. It depends which one of us is writing. That doesn't make any sense. I know most of the titles in Charlie's library by heart. I've never seen a random title appear on the shelf. At least, not that we didn't place there personally. That's where this gets complicated. Charlie's not connected to us anymore. He's no longer connected like he once was. Some of us no longer record. But Charlie does. And he also collects... But he's not connected, so we don't see his writings anymore. Your Charlie has titles that none of us have direct access to. Charlie knows things that even he isn't aware that he has in his head. That makes him valuable. That makes him desirable. 
that also unfortunately makes him a target. So you're targeting Uncle Charlie then? That's what this is about? No, I promise we're here to help. If we weren't, you wouldn't be in this room. I took a moment to process. Are we free to go? You're always free to leave anytime you wish, and you're welcome here anytime you'd like. What about Charlie? I can't exactly carry him out. Oh, yes. He'll go back to normal any minute now. The freezing thing is mostly temporary. So... Okay. Screw tape and wormwood, are they like you? Heavens no. They're demons. Well, they're not exactly your run-of-the-mill demons, either. They're pretty crafty. They managed to brainwash my intervals to do their bidding, and they did bring an evil piano into your life. But know this, not every piano is evil. It's a nature versus nurture thing. They've been looking to find Charlie, and many years ago they did just that, but they can't exactly walk in uninvited without purpose. But then again, we can't either. What are you? Can you pretend I'm six years old with limited language skills when you answer? Sarah chuckled. We're Athanasia. We're not gods. We're not humans. We simply are. We have everlasting life, but we can still die. We don't live, but we embrace time as we watch it pass. We've been here thousands of years watching the humans, and occasionally we bring one of you home that needs saving. But Charlie... Charlie's the one that needs to be saved now. I followed Sarah back down the corridor and back into the music room where Uncle Charlie was still frozen as we left him. The metronome was still ticking away on the piano, winding itself down. What was the water for? Hydration. It's important to stay hydrated. Keeps your mind sharp. Be careful not to overdo it. We don't need you drowning yourself from the inside out, Sarah winked. Now, sit where you were before. Here's the glass of water I promised you. And be mindful you don't spill it all this time. Pianos are a bit like puppies. They don't all enjoy getting wet. Sarah poured a glass of water and collected the empty smoothie glass and hid it away. I drank the water slowly, doing my best to take everything in as Sarah continued to explain. Every keyboard loves to be played as long as it's done well. Every piano also chooses its person. We rarely choose the piano. Some beasties can be tricky, like those that were out on the street many years ago that you and Charlie came across. Like the Hazelton, they were all trained by screw tape and wormwood. They are all their masters. And they're devoted to them. When the right creature comes along, they've been trained to possess them to play. It doesn't matter if they know how or not. The piano takes up the slack. You have the unique ability to remain unaffected. So how do we end it? They don't call out for you, do they? I scrunched up my forehead. Call out for me? They call out to Charlie. They call out to me. If I were to step into your home, I'd be in no better position than Charlie. You have three pianos. What about all of these? They chose me. Not all pianos are evil, but they do share the same weakness. You have a natural ability, George, that not everyone has. You're pretty good at the keys, and you learn quickly. Go home and play it. You'll be able to get closer to it if it doesn't think you're there to harm it. And you might be able to catch it off guard. You need to find a way to stop it without violence, or it knowing that you're involved. Violence is an impractical approach. It will simply spiral you into a descending ending of destruction, and everything you know and love will be gone. There's no benefit. There's no gain. Charlie will only see it briefly, and then forget your gesture moments later, and neither of you will be better off. The metronome came to a stop, finally running out of steam from the winding motor. He's about to come back to us, and it's for his own safety that he doesn't know about our little adventure today, or anything I've shown you. Promise me you can keep our secret, Sarah pleaded. I promise, I said. I trust you, she replied. Charlie came back into motion, thinking he simply dropped his book. Sarah and I pretended to finish the day's piano lesson like normal. Same time next week, I asked. Same time next week. We'll be here. We'll always be here.
That concludes episode 15 of How to Kill a Piano. Again, I'm George Tate. Thanks so much for listening. The piano music was played live uh, to broadcast or live to tape by yours truly. It had, of course, elements of Chopin's funeral march uh, woven into the music that we played impromptu. And, of course, reoccurring themes from throughout all of the episodes so far. Again, if you haven't shared this, please do so. Please uh, notify your friends, write a review if you can. And as always, we'll see you next Monday.